All right, everyone. A uh, happy Saturday. It's uh, 10 a.m. on the dot. I like to start on time, as you all have figured out by now. Um, and I'm excited for another family education and support uh, program, lecture, talk, whatever you want to call it. Um, I see some familiar uh, names pop up on the window. Welcome back. Thank you so much for being a part of this on a weekly basis. And I see some new names, so uh, welcome to the Family Education Support Program. And if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, I hope you find some value in this. Um, and it's our commitment to always make sure that we honor people's times by providing information that's valuable to them in the recovery process. So uh, all that being said, my name is Parham. I have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. I'm a licensed advanced alcohol and drug counselor. And I'm one of the people who helps manage Buckeye Recovery Network, the Ohio House, the Chadwick House. And this is something that I love to do, I'm passionate about, um, I get prepared for. And my hope is that uh, today's talk is gonna be something that you can take after this talk and actually apply to your life, right? And this, is, this talk is geared for family members. So if you're watching this because you have a loved one, a qualifier, uh, a son, a daughter, a spouse, a grandchild who is uh, currently in addictions or hopefully in recovery, uh, this talk is geared for you. And this is, uh, I did this talk originally on 5.9, so this is, uh, I'm recycling that talk with a few new pieces of information because I know some of you watched that. Uh, this one's titled Understanding the Recovery Process. And this is gonna be the last one of a 10-week curriculum that we created, and we talked about understanding addictions, understanding relapse, understanding the recovery process, self-care, trauma, instant gratification, boundaries, communication. Uh, and all of those videos can be found on Facebook. Um, and they're free, you know, it's, uh, even if you don't have Facebook, I believe they're public. Uh, I uploaded the most recent one on YouTube, so I've been kind of getting a little bit better of uploading those on YouTube. I know that we had a request from a really loyal fan to uh, post one of our original video contents on there and I will make sure that happens. Uh, I personally don't have that video, but I'll make sure I find it and make it happen. Um, so regardless, this one's called Understanding Recovery. And I actually just did this talk at nine o'clock with our men and women who we have in our program right now. So every Saturday morning I wake them up at nine and I give them a talk like this because uh, I believe you need to start the weekend off right-minded in order to deal with addictions because taking the foot off the gas on Saturday and Sunday puts us in a predicament on Monday because objects in motion stay in motion. And when you stagnate and stay stuck, it's hard to restart again. So that's why these Saturdays are really important to me. When we were doing these in person, I, would, I was uh, forcing the group to happen at 8 a.m. So they were having to wake up at like 6.37 just to show up to Parham talking. Uh, Zoom kind of saved them a little bit from that. But regardless, so we're talking about understanding the recovery process today, okay? Um, and this is, what, well, this is what it's all about. The recovery process is not just about stopping drugs and alcohol, stopping the use of substances, stopping the use of substances in, in your loved one's life. That's not the recovery process. That is just the prerequisite. That is just the, um, the bare minimum. The bare minimum of this whole thing is stopping the use of substances. After that is where the work begins. You know, as the counselor that got me clean and sober says, that's where the rubber hits the road. Okay. So, what is the recovery process? What does it mean to you, right? Everyone has their own definition. Everybody has their own concept, idea. Um, and how do you define it? You know, have you ever sat down to define what the recovery process is to you, right? And when is it time to start the recovery process, right? There's a good Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. My suggestion to you would say if the recovery process should have started five, 10, 15 years ago, the second best time to start the recovery process is right now while you're watching this uh, video and after you get off this video. Um, so before I get into that, I have a really wonderful analogy that hopefully is gonna help you understand the gravity and the power of addictions, okay? Because a lot of family members, not knowingly or not having the knowledge, information, resources, they try to deal with addiction on their own. They try to battle addiction on their own. They try to control it. They try to change it, they try to fix it, they try to rescue it, and time after time and time after again, they are faced with challenges, difficulties, and uh, failures, okay? So I wanna give you an analogy to use and hopefully take this analogy with you before we get into the recovery process. I need to illustrate what addictions actually looks like, right? 
And to do so, I want to use an analogy of, a, uh, of Mike Tyson. Okay, so Mike Tyson as addiction. And Mike Tyson, some, you know, I was teaching this a little bit ago to the youngins, and, and their point of reference for Mike Tyson is the movie Hangover and, you know, the funny character that he is in there, the, the, the loony character he is in there, but the funny one. And that's the only point of reference they have. Some of you, whether you like boxing or not, whether you like fighting or not, you know that back in the early 90s, Mike Tyson was larger than life. At the age of 19 years old, as a man-child, if you will, he was actually beating up grown men, and he became the champion, heavyweight champion of the world, 19 years old. And so what that means is Mike Tyson was a very powerful human being. And to the point that when he would go box in, in five seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, he would knock out the opponent. There's, there's clip after clip of him just first round knockouts, okay? So I want you to think of that power as addiction. And I want to think of you as the fighter. Okay, mom and dad, a grandma, spouse, a sister, brother. If you went in the ring with actual Mike Tyson for a fight, right? What would happen to you? Well, if you don't know, I'll tell you this. Within three to four seconds of you stepping in the ring with that human being, he would probably knock you out, okay? And now you're knocked out on the ground and you start thinking to yourself, and you, when you start kind of stumbling out and walking out of the ring and you start thinking to yourself, well, if I would have gone at him a little bit differently this way, I think I had a chance with him. So you walk away just kind of puzzled and thinking, you're like, you know what, I'm going to go get in the ring with Mike Tyson again. But this time, I'm going to go at it a little bit differently. Okay? So now you go home and you start, you know, you do your little your thought process, you take a shower, you get all ready, and you say, you know what, I'm going to go back in the ring with Mike Tyson because I think I got it this time. And so you walk down the ring, you have your background music playing, you get ready for the fight of your life. And what happens when you get in that ring? Well, mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, grandparents, if you don't know, I'll tell you. Within the first few seconds of that fight, Mike Tyson will knock you out again. But this time you get knocked down a little bit more. This time you start to see those little Tweety Birds like in the cartoons circling around your head. Maybe you got a concussion this time. Maybe you got physically hurt this time. And you stumble out of the ring and maybe 30, 60, 90 days later, you're sitting at home somewhere and saying, you know what? I think I can go fight with Mike Tyson, but this time I'm just going to go train a little bit harder and get my lungs a little stronger. That way, when I go in the ring with him, I'm not going to run out of energy. So the delusion and the insanity of repeating something and expecting different results is where I'm heading at here. You walk back to the ring with Mike Tyson and this time you say, okay, well, I'm in better shape now. I can dodge him a little bit. I can dodge addiction. I can dodge Mike Tyson. And what's going to happen within a few seconds of fighting with that human being, he's going to knock you out. And this is the last time I'll share this, but this time you get knocked out to the point that maybe you're in a coma. Maybe the, they put a neck brace around your neck and carry you out in a stretcher. And as you're going away in a stretcher towards the hospital, you start thinking to yourself, well, maybe if I train in high altitude, I can, I can develop a little bit different type of fight style. Maybe if I change the way I, I, I punch, go from righty to lefty, I can fight with Mike Tyson. And these crazy thoughts start happening in the minds of family members about how they're trying to deal with addiction. So the last analogy is this, is you go back and you start walking towards the ring for one more fight against Mike Tyson, right? And you're going there, you got your music playing, you're pumped up, you're ready to go. You're like, this time I got it. I'm going to change addiction in the life of my loved one. And you go there and here's where the recovery process begins, okay? You stand in the ring, you stand looking at the ring before you get in. And you take a look at Mike Tyson and you say, you know what? I can no longer go to fight, go to battle, go to war with this being, with this entity, with Mike Tyson, with addiction. You take a look and say, you know what? I've had it. I'm sick and tired of trying to fix this. I'm sick and tired of trying to fight this. And you know what you do in that moment? Instead of going in the ring where you will get knocked out again, you turn around and you start walking away from the ring. You start walking away. And as you're walking away, you see another family member, right? Walking towards the ring with Mike Tyson, going to do the same fight you've done time after time, day after day, week after week, month after month, for some of you year after year. They're walking that way and you look at them and for a moment your stomach drops because you know exactly what's going to happen to them. And you continue going. And what happens in that walking away is where the recovery process begins is where you start, you, you, you accept your powerlessness against this addiction. If you, by the way, as a family member, have not accepted the fact that you're powerless over the addiction of your loved one yet, 
I strongly urge you to see how you can come to that conclusion. Where do you come to that conclusion? Take a good look at the autobiography of your experience with your, with your loved one. You'll see time after time, experience after experience, situation after situation, you have proof in your own history that you've been powerless. You've always been powerless. You will continue to be powerless. So as you walk away from the rink, you just trust that your loved one, right, is battling. Hopefully they get to the same conclusion. Today when I was sharing with this, my, my emphasis was to walk away from this ring and surround yourself with people that can teach you how to not get in that ring and have a fulfilling life, right? Same thing happens for family. So my friends, when will you stop getting in the ring? Some of you have and some of you keep jumping in there and you keep getting beat up and wondering why. The only outcome with fighting against Mike Tyson is to get knocked out. The only outcome with battling addiction on your own is to get knocked out, right? I can't say this any more clear. I spent 10 minutes trying to uh, bring that point to uh, home. So hopefully we got there. Um, so the recovery process is why you're here today. That's what we're talking about. I, as you know, I like to break words down and I like to look at them in, in isolated meetings. So let's look at the word recover. So to recover something, it means to regain something that has been lost, stolen, or destroyed. That's what the word recover means. So if you go open up a dictionary and you look at the word recover, it means to regain something that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed. Okay? And the word process, it means a series of actions and steps taken in a specific order to achieve a certain outcome. Okay, so that's, if you look at the dictionary word for, for process, that's what actually shows up. So now you combine these two words together because we're trying to figure out what the recovery process means. So the recovery process means this. It means to take a series of actions and steps and to take them in a specific order to achieve a certain outcome. And what outcome is that? To regain something that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed. And that's the recovery process, right? So I'm not saying the definitions that you have or the things that you think of are, are wrong, but this is what I want you to use as a, as a framework for us. And what is it that we're trying to regain that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed? Well, as a family member, you're trying to find that connection to yourself. Addiction disconnects you to yourself. It, so, if, you know, we, we pay so much attention to the addiction of the loved one because it's do or die, it's, do or die, it's life or death. It's a lot of legal issues, a lot of financial issues. It's very distracting. It's just like this big, uh, you know, alarms and lights going off. And it's just, it's loud and it's in your face and it's insidious. It keeps coming and coming and coming. But in that process, do you know what's happening? By being so externally focused on addictions, you are by default not focused on self, right? You're not internally focused. You can't be externally focused and internally focused at the same time. It's impossible, right? So addiction of a loved one makes us just focus out and by default we lose the connection to self and we become disconnected, right? How many family members through the process of addiction have lost connection to their health, their finances, their relationships, their employment, their, um, their own internal processes, right? Their own identity, their own goals, their own values, their own dreams, right? So the recovery process, you know what that becomes? The recovery process becomes this, is how am I going to get reconnected to myself? Moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, spouses, it's not about them getting clean and sober. It's about how you get reconnected to yourself because a reconnected version of self has a heck of a lot better chance of supporting someone through the addiction process, right? So, um, when I get through that, I want to talk about this analogy that uh, it's, it's very, very appropriate. Um, I'm going to share it first from the, um, the individuals experiencing alcohol and drug addiction from their perspective, just so you get an idea as a family member of where they stand with this analogy. And then I'm going to flip it and I'm going to use it for you as a family member. Okay. So the analogy that I'm going to share with you right now is what I shared in the morning with uh, our, our patients. Okay. So I want you to look at recovery as a tunnel. So we're going to call this the recovery tunnel. Okay. And here's the recovery tunnel. The drug addict, the alcoholic, the individual experiencing addictions on this side of the tunnel, you know, I'll move my hand over so you can see it. But on this side of the tunnel is where they came from. So on this side, 
is their, um, their old friends, the old neighborhoods, the old lifestyle, um, the addiction, and it's very familiar to them. So when you tell uh, you know, someone that's experiencing addictions, a client of ours, tell me about that tunnel, they can illustrate a picture that's very, it's not empowering, I'll tell you that. It's really dark and dim and depressed and sad, and, and um, that's where they come from. Okay, like their world, their, their external internal world is that. So people like me tell them, hey, if you walk in this tunnel, the recovery tunnel, your life will get better. So they're saying, well, it can't get any worse than this. I might as well walk through this tunnel. So they take a step into this tunnel. And at first, there's just like anything that's new and fresh. It's exciting. It's like, oh, my God, ah, my life's going to get better. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that behind. I'm going through this tunnel and everything's going to get better. Right. And they start taking some steps in this little tunnel and they're moving and they're moving. And as they're walking into the tunnel, when they look back from where they came from, the light's getting smaller and smaller because with distance and perspective, perception changes and the light's getting smaller. And they look ahead of them and they unfortunately can't see another light. The other side of the tunnel has not revealed itself to them yet. Okay. So as they're walking, where they came from is getting smaller and smaller and where they're going to has not revealed itself yet. Eventually they get to a point and they're standing in the tunnel, maybe 30, 60, 90 days later, and they're, they, they kind of come to a standstill because they look back and the light that they came from is no longer there. It's completely pitch black. And they look forward and the light that they tell them is coming is no, hasn't, hasn't revealed itself yet. It's pitch black. So then in a standstill, what people do in an addiction world is they do something called stagnation. And stagnation means just to kind of freeze right? And they stagnate. And if somebody stagnates in life, will they ever see the possibility that exists ahead of them? The answer is no, because without forward movement, that light will not reveal itself. So we talked about this in relapse the other time. So after stagnation, what happens is this thing called regression. So people actually start taking steps backwards. And when they start taking steps backwards, they see the small light that they came from. And I don't know about you, but I've watched a lot of movies and, and, and heard the metaphor enough times to know this is when people feel lost, what do they do? They make a U-turn and go right back where they came from, right? So in that moment of isolation, in that moment of fear, in that moment of doubt, people go back to what's familiar to them because the fear of the unknown is one of the biggest fears human beings have. And at least back there on that side, as bad as it was and as dark as it was, they at least are familiar with what to expect the people there, the places there, the things there, the lifestyle there. And guess what? The 30, 60, 90 days into this process, the mind starts thinking that, hey, I can go get in the ring back with Mike Tyson, right? How many of you can relate to that? So they go back to where they came from. But here's the thing. You remember the, the standstill I was talking about, the, the moment of uh, stagnation? Sometimes just a little bit of courage. And courage is what? Courage means to be able to take action despite a fear. So a little bit of courage in that moment of just being afraid, one step forward might be enough for them to be able to see the light from the other side of the tunnel. And this has happened, by the way. You know, there's, there's been clients that said, hey, you know, I'm, I've had it. I can't do this anymore. And just taking a few positive steps, a few positive actions, a few positive thought processes in the right direction, they're able to see a glimpse of hope. And sometimes if they can't do it on their own, the importance of having people around you that are supportive in the same process with you, that's why support groups are important, people can actually push you through to see the other side. Because once you see the other side of the tunnel, that's where all of a sudden there's a new found energy and motivation that gets created. And people start to go a little bit quicker to that because you know, they, they see the progress. It's kind of like when you're trying to lose weight and you, the first few pounds go and you start to see the process, you, you get motivated. But without that first initial kind of um, you know, uh, success, it's really hard to stay motivated, if you will. So people start going, and here's the thing. So what happens on that side of the recovery tunnel for addicts, alcoholics is this. They actually get reconnected to themselves. And what does that mean? Is towards the end of addiction, uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, they start to avoid mirrors. So they don't like looking in mirrors anymore. They don't like the reflection because they can't identify with who it is looking back at them. They've lost connection to self. And through the process of recovery, um, there's people that say, hey, I can finally look at myself in the mirror again. I like the reflection looking back at me. I'm proud of the reflection looking back at me. So what does that tell me? The recovery process helped them get reconnected to self, something that was lost 
stolen or destroyed that connection to self. So that's the kind of, if you ever want to know what your loved one goes through in that process, they do get to that dark space. And here's the thing. A lot of them already have serious trust issues with, uh, counselors, clinicians, authority figures, uh, uh, people that are telling them something's good for them. They have these serious trust issues. So to be in a dark, isolated place saying, Hey, trust me, your life is going to get better. If you walk through here, that's a hard thing to get through to them. Um, so just have some compassion if they're in that dark space, just entrust that there's enough people that are pushing them in the right direction. Because again, you're powerless over this, unfortunately. You're outside the tunnel. You actually have no control of what's happening inside the tunnel. You might think you do, but you don't. So for family members, it's the same analogy, right? Um, you're living out there, you know, when your loved one's going through addiction, sleepless nights, you sleep with a phone on your chest because you uh, are waiting for the call. Um, you are always ready to drive somewhere to go pick your loved one up because you don't know what's happening. You're hiding things from your spouse or your loved one or family members because of the guilt and the shame and covering up and codependency and all that stuff like that. Uh, you've spent all your resources, maybe got into your 401k for finances, all that kind of stuff like that because you're trying to figure this thing out. You're trying to go to fight with Mike Tyson time after time. And you get into this, they tell you, hey, just go into recovery and your life's going to get better. And you're like, well, it can't get worse than it is out there. So you walk into this tunnel, you walk into the recovery process and you go in there. And this happens to family members too. At first you're excited, you're motivated, you're pumped, you're jazzed. You're in there and you're walking through and eventually it gets to the point that you don't see the positive effects of recovery in your life. You know, regardless of what's happening with your loved one in your life, you don't see the positive stuff happening because... Maybe the only reason you walked in was because of your loved one. Maybe you didn't walk in the recovery tunnel because of yourself. I'm telling you, family members are just as impacted by the process of addictions than addicts and alcoholics are. It just shows up in different ways, my friends. The same way a drug addict feels disconnected from themselves, so do family. I can sit down with a family member and within five, seven, eight, ten minutes of the, the session, they will be completely overwhelmed with emotions. And they're not even the ones doing the drugs because there's a lot of guilt that goes with it. There's a lot of shame that goes with it. There's a lot of displaced fault blame that goes with it. It's not even your fault, but you, you take it on. There's a lot of um, lost self, lost goals, lost dreams. I mean, families are just as traumatized through this process. So you get through this. So here's the thing. If you're in that spot right now, listening to me in the middle of the tunnel, and I don't have to say what that is, but if you're stagnated, if you're not doing things for your recovery, you will make a U-turn and go back to what's comfortable. Right? And my hope is, my prayer is actually that you don't go back in the ring again with Mike Tyson because the same outcome is going to happen. So it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of um, encouragement to move through this tunnel. That's what these talks are for. You know, that's what these, uh, these uh, things are inspired to do is to be able to give you just a little bit of hope on a Saturday to kind of continue with your recovery process. You know, starting next week, I really want to do this questions and answers stuff. So if you have a line of communication to me, it's uh, parum at buckeyerecoverynetwork.com. Send me any questions you have. If you want to send them on Facebook, send them on Facebook. I'm the one that reads all the, the, the messages there. I will for sure answer your questions. So if you have questions about the tunnel, of what it feels, if you have questions about your loved one, addiction, if you have questions about recovery, let's get a questions and answer process. I'll answer them all live for you guys. Um, you know, I'll read off the question and answer it. I think it'd be a great way to do it. But um, that's what this is for, to stay motivated in the recovery process, right? So I keep talking about addictions uh, and disconnection, right? And uh, recovery being connection. So I want you to talk, I want to I wanna, uh, sidestep over here and talk about something that's a very important study that has been around since, uh, 2015 is when the reports of it came around. But in 2001, the country of Portugal, with you know, the, the Lisbon being one of the biggest cities over there, they, uh, they were experiencing um, a crisis with intravenous heroin and cocaine use. Right? It was a crisis to the point that they had the most addicts per popula. So their population isn't that big, but they had the most addicts per popula that were using intravenous heroin. A lot of overdoses, a lot of uh, um, consequences because of it, you know, health consequences. And they were subscribed to the same model that we unfortunately have in the United States with how we treat human beings that are going through addictions, which is the criminal justice system. 
So some of you are saying, well, well that's not our experience, you know, and, and I was actually telling your loved ones this today to actually be grateful because if it wasn't for your family members, right, support, whether that comes in the form of, uh, you know, they're employed and you're on their health insurance policy or the fact that they might just have some finances left over to be able to spend on your treatment or that they're resourceful enough that they just know some people in the sober community that they were able to ask for help, you know, that kind of stuff like that. And you're sitting here listening to Param speak on a Saturday at home and you're getting exposed to sound healing and meditation and group therapy every day and, and good clinicians. Don't, ex don't think that that's the way addiction treatment happens. That's just the way it's happening to you. If you strip those resources away from a human being in the United States, addiction treatment happens behind bars. People just like you, you know, people just like your children, just like your children, if they can't get help in the treatment world, because county facilities, man, it's, it's, it's good luck getting a bed. You have to call every single day. If you miss a phone call, they drop you back to the beginning of the line. There's, there's very scarce resources. Human beings, just like me, instead of going to treatment, end up in jails end up locked up behind bars. That's where our treatment model goes. So Portugal was the same way. And I'm not making this up, by the way. There's a 2.2 million people in the United States, as I'm talking to you right now, are locked up behind bars. 2.2 million people. And just to put that into scale, uh, the United States has 5% of the world's population, but we house 20 to 25% of the world's inmates. So one out of every four to five people locked up in the world is locked up in the United States. And who are these people that are locked up? They're not all violent offenders or, you know, the, the crimes you see on CSI and, and those kind of things. A lot of these people are just individuals experiencing mental health issues. It, they're the most traumatized. If you look at their backgrounds and upbringings, they were just um, multi-generational trauma. And a lot of them show up into addictions, right? So instead of treating these people, we lock them up and that's our treatment. So Portugal was doing the same thing. So one day they said, man, we can't do this anymore. These people... It, our solution is becoming a part of the problem because what happens to those individuals, my friends, when they come out of jail, when they come out of prison, right? Some of your children might be going through this, but, but they start to develop probation and parole records. They start to have rap sheets. And then when they go apply for a job, right? And, and the, the resume happens and they have to write down, have you ever been convicted of a, of a misdemeanor, of a felony? If yes, explain why. And yes, there's something called, you know, discrimination. You can't discriminate based on that. But, and you can't say, this is the sole reason why we're not giving you the job. But that could be the reason why they're not giving you the job. They just don't have to disclose that information, right? So the one that comes out, the, the addict alcoholic that comes out of serving rehabilitation time comes out and is unable to get a job, is unable to land back on its feet. No one wants to take a chance on them. And maybe they even are going to an IOP, but they can't get a job. And what happens is, and I'm not excusing the behavior, I'm not saying that this is right, but what happens is many of them go back to their old lifestyle because of the roadblocks that they're experiencing. And on the Department of Justice, you know, the, the, the official website, it says somewhere between 78 and 82% of people after a certain period of time, you know, it's like different time periods, they end up going back into the prison system. 78 to 82%. So what's that telling me? Whatever they're doing is not working or it's working for that system. So Portugal was doing the same thing, and they said this, they said, okay, when Johnny or Mary gets discharged from jail sentence and, and rehabilitation, we need to help them feel like human beings again. We need to help them feel connected to society again. We need to help them feel like they're not less than, that they're not their record, they're not their history, they're not their addiction. They're human beings that experienced that at one point. So they went through a bunch of local businesses, right? They went through a bunch of local resources businesses and they said, here's this, if you hire this person into your facility, into your organization, the government, we will pay half of their wages to you. So we will pay half of the wages for this person to come work for your, uh, for your office, for your uh, maintenance, for your, um, as an electrician, as a caregiver, whatever the heck it was, right? We'll pay for half of their wages and you're only responsible for the other half. So this incentivized the community to hire these individuals, right? And they were already rehabilitated. So they were sober, they'd served their time, they did some programming, they're ready for this, right? It's not just straight off the street putting them there. And what they realized was not only were the employers excited because they saved half the cost, the, the human being that just got released felt like, oh my God, they're giving me another chance right? They're giving me another chance. They're giving me another chance. I'm reconnected. 
I'm not just a street creature. I'm not someone that just hears no all the time. And the beauty of this is this, and over 10 year study, so just go look this up, go put Portugal study um, addictions, you know, it's good enough keywords. Over a 10 year period of time, there was a 50%, five zero percent decrease in intravenous heroin and cocaine use in the country of Portugal. Just by implementing this form of treatment, which is to reconnect human beings that have been disconnected for so long, right? And it's the exact opposite of the model that we unfortunately have. Exact opposite of it. I mean, our model's not working. There's no rocket science here to say this. You know, th this kind of stuff works because it's so comprehensive and it's so multifaceted, but this isn't the norm, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, when they say in 2016, 2017, there was 65,000 people a year that died from opioid overdose. You know, you sh you've heard me share that before. That's more fatalities and more deaths than Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq war combined in just one year, right? So whatever this war on drugs or war on opiates is, man, it's, it's just completely skewed. We have to think about how can we create a pathway to connection, right, of a recovery, to reconnect something that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed. So um, this next one that I have here is uh, it's, it's, it's a good one. Um, it's actually my favorite thing. Out of all the stories I ever share, all the analogies that I teach, it's actually my favorite one. I, I shared this again back on 5.9, so this is a repeat for some of you, but maybe listen to it with a new experience, right? There's a beautiful quote that says, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know, and the ears can't hear what the mind doesn't know. So if you've ever been exposed to any type of information, that's the beauty of recovery. You know, I could read the same stuff over and over again in life. And based on where I am in that moment, based on the experience that I'm having, the, the experiences that I've had, what I'm about to do, how I'm feeling, you know, it completely resonates differently. So the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know and the ears can't hear what the mind doesn't know. And uh, this story is wonderful. Uh, if you take one thing from you from this talk, I hope you take this with you. Uh, I mean, the Mike Tyson stuff and the tunnel stuff and the Portugal study stuff was wonderful. Don't get me wrong. Take all those, actually. But take this one, too. And this one, it's, uh, it's a story called The Man and the Map. Okay? And here it is. It's a story about this dad. He's a hardworking, blue-collar, construction, manual labor guy that um, he's lost his wife. And he has a young son, about six, seven, eight years old, and he's raising him on his own. So you can imagine the world that this guy has. And in the morning, you know, he, he wakes up really early, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and he goes out and he starts paving some concrete, paving the ground, you know, working hard, uh, and, the, and the sun's glaring on his back. And fortunately enough, he has his mother in his life, so the grandmother of his child, that can come and take care of the son while he's gone and, and kind of be supportive to him. So thank God for that. And every day he goes to work and the son's kind of just at home. And, and when he comes back, you know, around 2, 3, 4 in the afternoon, the son is just waiting for dad because, I mean, it's dad's his hero. It's his role model. It's his, um, it's his, it's his everything, right? And the dad comes home exhausted, tired, and he kind of just sits there. And the kid says, dad, dad, I've been waiting for you all day. Oh, my gosh, let's go play. Let's go play. Let's go play. And the dad says, oh, man, dude, like, just give me five minutes. I just, I just got home. Let me go wash my face. Uh, let me just rest first. Yeah, just give me five minutes. So five minutes goes by and the kid comes back and he says, dad, it's been five minutes. I'm ready to go play right now. I want to show you all the paintings I've drawn. And the dad says, Hey, I just, I need to eat something first. My stomach's really empty. Uh, I've had a hard day. Can you just let me put the food in the oven and we'll play when it's done. So 10 minutes later, the kids comes back and says, dad, it's been time. I saw you just eat your food. We're, we're ready to go, right? Let's go play. Let's go play football. And the dad says, Oh man, something just broke on the news right here on CNN. And I got to watch or Fox news. I don't know whichever one you prefer. doesn't matter to me. Um, I need to go watch this thing over here. And uh, so the kid puts his head down and he goes away and, and comes back and he says, dad, let's go play. You know, the news is over now. Let's go play. And dad's like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I can't get rid of this guy. What am I going to do? So he looks around finding ways to distract and, and, he, and he finds this, uh, you know, this magazine he's, he has on the coffee table and he opens it up and inside there's this pullout and there's this, uh, he pulls out this, this big kind of uh, piece of paper and on that piece of paper, it's kind of like the atlas of the world. And it has like North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. It's got the two poles. And he grabs this map and he tears it in half and he tears it in half and tears it in half and tears it in half and tears it in half. Gets a bunch of little pieces and he gives it to his son. 
And he says, son, whenever you take this world back together, I'll come and I'll play with you. So the kid looks very discouraged, you know, shoulders slumped down and he kind of gets sad and he walks away because he feels that this task is too great for him. But 10 minutes later, he's back again. And the dad's like, what the heck? How'd you do that? He's like, dad, that was easy. On the back of all these little pieces of paper that you gave me, there was a little picture of a man. So when I taped the man together, on the back side, this whole world came together, right? So when I taped the man together, on the back side, the whole world came together. So why is this uh, story important in understanding recovery? I can share a little bit of glimpse of Parham uh, prior to 2008. So I got sober June 13th, 2008. So prior to that, um, my world, let me give you a quick snapshot of it. And I do have uh, my mom and dad are watching this, so they're my fact checkers. So whatever I say to you is, is approved through them. I'm not making nothing up. But my world prior to getting sober, my map, if you will, was tore up in different pieces. So what pieces are we talking about? My health was seriously detriment. I mean, my, I was, I was, there was a lot of blood coming out of me, multiple different places. Um, I was, I, you know, had other physical illnesses that were happening with me. Uh, my finances were really bad. I mean, I was always overdrafted at Washington Mutual. I'm talking about always. I was a college dropout. I left school about 20 years old and I didn't get back in there until I was, got sober. So around 25 years old. So for five years, I just kind of drifted away. Uh, I had no true relationships with my family, no relationships with my brother, no um, relationships with others. You know, I was uh, really in a dark space, if you will. Um, no romantic relationships really, you know, because of my addiction. I didn't have a good job. Um, I was seriously struggling with that confidence in that area. And my, I had a raging addiction, right? Alcohol, weed, substances, uh, cocaine, whatever you want to call it. It was just a part of my world, right? So that was my world. And what I would do is I would try to go tape this world back together all the time. Right. I kept, you know, kept, kept trying to take this world back together. But the more I would focus on one area, another area would fall apart. Right. So the more I spent on my health, then another area would fall apart over here with my relationships. The more I focus on my education, another thing on employment would fall apart. And it was just kind of like trying to clog the holes of a sinking ship. No matter what I did somewhere else it would happen. Now, if you take a look at all the different areas in my life, my my health, my wealth, my relationships, my romantic ones, my education, my vocation, my addiction, all of those areas in life had one thing in common. They all had one common denominator. And that one common denominator was me. I was the common denominator to all of the problems in my life. Right? And you know, basic math teaches us the easiest way to solve a problem is to identify the common denominator. Because when you address the common denominator, the rest of it falls in place, right? So instead of looking externally of taping this world back together in the recovery process to regain something that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed, I had to look inward, internally, and start taping myself together. Start figuring out who and what I was and why I had gotten to this point. And when I started taping myself together, all of these other areas in life started to come together on the backside. So as a family member, um, please listen to that because there are different parts of your life that potentially in this moment could be tore up, right? And even if like, here's the thing, it's like some families on the surface, because they're able to maintain and they're able to function, they think that that doesn't mean that there's little tears all over the world, all over the place, right? So the level of severity might be different for different people, right? It's not as severe as a human being going through serious addiction. But if you really were honest with yourself and you kind of look at the different areas in your life and ask, okay, from one to 10, how satisfied am I with this area, right? I highly doubt that you're going to get eight, nines, and tens in all these places because you're a human being and that's just not the way life works. So if you look at yourself, and this is the hard part to swallow sometimes, is you are the common denominator to all of the problems in your life you. And I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not putting blame on you, right? It's not your fault if there's some area in your life that out of your control is impacted. But there's some truth that you are a common denominator of that area. You exist in that area. So you look at your relationship with that area. 
and make a decision. And that's the recovery process. That's why I said just your loved ones stopping the, drug, the drink or the drug is not enough to sustain recovery. You have to say, okay, what do I need to gain out of this for myself? And recovery is a journey, right? So as cliche as that sounds, there's some serious truth in that. Recovery is a journey, right? There's no, there's no time frame to it at all. And it's a journey of the self. It's a journey through the self. And it's a journey to the self. So of the self means you have to introspect and you have to look at yourself. Just, you know, 360 bird's eye view, however you want to say, you have to look at your life. To recover, you have to look at your life. And then through the self means you actually have to dive in through the weeds, man. You got to get in there. You have to look at the different areas in your life. You can't have a journey without actually going through something. So you have to go through self. And remember last week we talked about the cure for the pain is in the pain. The avoidance of pain produces more pain. So you have to get in there and you got to go through the self. And ultimately the goal is to get to the self. And what is to the self means? It means to get reconnected to self, right? I told the, the clients this morning that if some of you actually sat down and realized how much you actually miss yourself, right? How long it's been since you've actually seen yourself, been with yourself, um, felt yourself, you won't be able to hold back the tears because it's okay to miss ourselves. And, and there's nothing like addiction that takes us away from ourselves. So recovery, which is the opposite of it, needs to have a process that gets us reconnected to that. So in conclusion, um, today was, uh, you know, this was, this was great. Because I think the reason why we're all here is because we, we want the recovery process. We hopefully believe in the recovery process. And we're starting to see parts of the recovery process in our life, right? So, um, you know, we talked about the definition of it, which is to regain something that's been lost, stolen, or destroyed. We talked about the Mike Tyson analogy. You know, that's, I take that with you. Go watch this one again because how many times have you gotten in the ring with the same, with the same beast, the beast of addiction? And how, what's the outcome been like that? You know, we talked about the connection, the importance of connection, the Portugal model, talked about the recovery tunnel, you know, which is just a wonderful thing and the man in the map, you know, so there's so much in here. You can go back and read what you want. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a few people writing comments here. Uh, and thank you for your support every single week. Um, this is great. I mean, this is, this is what, this was my vision back in May when we started this thing was to be able to create this opportunity for people to connect, to get some really good information, but also have a safe space that they can kind of be a part of the community that's bigger than themselves. Uh, and, and imagine this, I mean, down the line for, for those of you who, who stay committed to this, there's going to be moms and dads and spouses and grandparents that are going to come through and maybe your experience, your strength, your hope and what you've gained out of all these talks can get to them better than even I can get to them. Because sometimes a mom or a dad or someone that's been through the process that's had those sleepless nights can talk to another mom or dad that's had those sleepless nights and say, hey, I get it. That was me not too long ago. This is where I am today. This is how I got here. And if you can start doing that in your process of recovery, then you'll start to feel a fulfillment that's unlike anything else. That's how addicts and alcoholics, they say, make sure you don't keep what you got without giving it away. Don't be stingy with your recovery. If your life's getting better, go find a mom or dad or someone out there that their life is really, really struggling and go help them the heck out, right? That's what this whole thing's about. Transform people, transform people. So don't keep all this to yourself if you're starting to experience the gifts of recovery. Make sure you give it away. So all that being said, it's been about 45 minutes. I love and appreciate all you guys. I'll see you next week with some questions and answers. Make sure you send me some stuff. If not, I'm gonna go find some people and get some questions from them. So. Um, thank you so much and we'll talk soon.